welcome to another Indie Dev Showcase here on the channel. Every Wednesday night, our streams are nothing but indie games submitted by developers, and these videos kind of recap those plays. If you'd like to submit a game for a future one, please don't hesitate to get in touch. But for our first game, we are taking a look at Crown Trick. This is a roguelike with some very impressive art and aesthetics. So the version that we played is from a demo that was released, I believe, a few months ago at the time of this recording. But the general gameplay is that this is your standard roguelike. It features we go combat, so everything moves when you move. With kind of like the key elements of this is kind of embracing more of a loot driven or kind of loot focus design. As you play through, you're going to find gear and various items, as we see in other roguelikes, with weapons belonging to different classes, and they'll have a kind of a different feel to them, such as weapons that are better for attacking wide enemies, piercing, combos, and so on. You also get skills that you see at the bottom of the screen that can be activated with a turn-based cooldown. And this is kind of how you really have to survive with Crown Trick. As you can see, enemies make use of area affecting skills, and as with most of these roguelikes, you are going to be outnumbered. And when you die, like you see right there, the game restarts and the world gets randomly reshuffled, as we always see. And the title does a good job of giving you a very wide set of strategies and potential things you can make use of. As you can see me teleporting around, summoning characters to aid, and there is, I believe the loot may be randomly generated or procedurally generated as you find higher quality versions of it, but with our time on the demo here, I couldn't really confirm yes or no. Now, if you look on the right hand side of the screen where it says combo, as you keep attacking enemies and kind of keeping the aggression on, you'll get a combo modifier that increases the amount of damage that you do. And this is again one of the ways that the game is trying to give you a possible strategy for dealing with overwhelming numbers of foes. You'll also find additional familiars who will lend you kind of their spells or abilities. And I believe there is a very light persistence of unlocking new starting conditions. But again, we really couldn't see a lot of that in the demo. Now, one area where Crown Trick reminds me of the game Sharon the Wanderer is with the idea of boss fights. And the version that we play kind of ended with this fight between these three witches. And I really like this idea that you have to do more than just have a solid build to win. You need to plan ahead and kind of figure out what kind of trick, no pun intended, the boss is going to make use of that you're going to have to get around. With that said though, it does present kind of an issue with these kinds of games. That when you have fixed boss fights and randomly acquired gear and strategies, it can definitely have an effect on the difficulty of the game. And some people were reporting having some frustration with this fight. And it definitely seemed like if you didn't have the right strategy in mind, especially with being able to get in and out of the enemy's attack range, you're going to be in for some big trouble. As you can see fighting this boss, you can see her immunities at the top of the screen. And if, for instance, you were a Scorch-based build, you would be in for some big trouble right about now. And I'm hoping the developers did look at the boss fights and kind of balancing them out, because Crown Trek definitely has some potential. If you're looking for more of the classical style roguelike, but with the added improvements of the aesthetics and the variety of builds. So I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye out for when Crown Trick is released later this year. Moving on, we come to the game Pangean. This is a roguelike dungeon crawler here. The graphic style remind me kind of like a Minecraft or some like the lower bit games that we've seen. 
And the idea, of course, is that we pick one of three classes, and we go dungeon crawling in Pangean to hopefully save the world, defeat the bad guy, and you get the picture. So, the game itself tries to build itself as a roguelike, that when you die, you restart the game, and that loot is randomly driven. The problem, though, is that the level layouts themselves don't seem to be procedurally generated, or even just randomly generated. And outside of, I guess, different loot or the appearance appearance of items, nothing really is changing. And that is a very serious problem in a game that you're meant to replay. Now, what you're seeing here with the combat is what kind of killed this game for me. Enemies move very fast, and oftentimes they can move faster than you. And the window for basically being able to attack them, pushing them back, and not getting hit by them is very narrow and it leaves the combat feeling very unrefined and it's very easy for one or two enemies to just wreck you and it didn't feel like I could do anything to avoid it. This is one of those games where range attacks seem to be the superior option as of course you're able to attack these enemies and not have to worry about them getting in close to kill you. And unfortunately, like for me, like I like the general idea of this game, but it's just one of those cases where the gameplay itself just hamstrings the entire experience. But with that, let's move on to something that is completely different. This is Star Crossed. And I guess the simplest way to describe this would be a story and emotionally driven punk game that's also co-op. The game itself can be played single player, with you basically controlling both of your characters using the twin analog sticks. And the game is set up with these characters trying to save their universe or their galaxy from an evil, and it's up to the chosen ones to basically save the day. Now the twist of how the Pong works is that the quote unquote Pong Pal, that's that star you see bouncing around is does not get really controlled by kind of the player it basically will automatically track whoever it's going to be aimed at based on their position so there is a lot of coordination that goes into playing starcross you see at the bottom of the screen that you get a super meter and the super meter fills as you attack enemies as well as time perfect bounces between the two characters when it fills up you get a special attack and the special is based on whichever character activates it. And the general gameplay shows you moving from scene to scene, dealing with these enemies. They appear to be randomly placed on each playthrough. But you're going to move from scene to scene, kill the enemies, move on to the next, and every few scenes there is a boss fight. With that said, Starcross does have a few issues I want to point out. So, the first one is that, well, you can die very easily, as you saw right there. You see, even though each character has their own health bar, it basically, if one character runs out of health, it's game over. Now, this presents a very confusing, kind of frustrating issue, as hearts will sometimes appear on screen, but it only counts for the person who picks it up. So if, let's say, as the purple character over there, I have full health and the other one has one point of health left, and I pick it up as them, the other character will not get it. And it's just a very cumbersome system right there. Another thing is that the difficulty of this game, or the game itself, kind of betrays the difficulty of playing it. This is a very hard game to play. Single player, it's incredibly difficult. But even with co-op and having somebody else control the other paddle, you still have to work in uh, concordance with each other in order to have any chance of getting through. So as you see these enemies right here, who can bounce the paddle back, you have to move, maneuver them just perfectly to get those hits in and the boss fights can become incredible challenges and the game introduces a little bit of a shmup aspect when things go bullet hell on you. 
Now, you are able to dash, and the dash does grant you iframes, but again, if you're going into this kind of for the focus on the story, or just the general gameplay, there is a lot to take in that I feel the developers could do a better job of conveying or accommodating players for. There, does, there did not appear to be any difficulty sliders or anything like that when I play this, and this was like a few months ago for, as a footage that you're seeing here. And I'm just not quite sure who the market was for this game in terms of the content and the gameplay itself. If you and a friend are looking for a very challenging game, and oh, and by the way, it is only local co-op, no online play, although on Steam it doesn't really matter, then Starcross may be a good one to take a look at. But if what you've seen so far is not exciting you, then I think you can write this one off your list. But with that, we're going to take a quick break and come back with a few more indie games for this video. And now for a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. Going forward, all Patreon supporters will get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. For our next game, we turn to Galaxy Warfighter. So for this one, it is essentially billed as a roguelike shmup. And that in and of itself is definitely a great concept. And general gameplay is that we are going through these various levels. Killing the enemies gets us the money that you've seen up right, and then that money is used after each mission or after you die to then outfit your ship, unlocking new abilities such as having drones that follow you around, improve your damage potential, health, all that other great stuff. Get some smart bombs as you saw right there. At the end of each level, there is a boss fight, and this game is just completely built on kind of the arcade style, play as long as you can, when you fail, restart the game. And from a basic standpoint, there really wasn't anything wrong with the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Galaxy Warfighter. My problem is that I feel like this concept needs more depth. That there has to be more to it than what we're seeing here. And we played this for about, I think it was like 40 minutes to an hour. And in that entire time, we saw, I think, at most three, maybe four different bosses, the game repeats a lot of the environments and enemies, and the levels themselves did not appear to have any kind of environmental obstacles or any real uh, impact on actually playing the game. And that is very unfortunate. Because I think the idea of a shmup roguelike is a solid concept for any developer to work on. And unfortunately, what we see here, it's just not enough, I feel, to hold your interest beyond just an initial play. Now, we did play this several months ago, so I do not know if developers did update or add any new content to it. But if you are looking for a game to be inspired about in terms of a shmup with roguelike elements, I would say give this one a try, and I hope somebody is working on a more fleshed out version of this gameplay loop. And with that, we then turn to something that is also another interesting take on roguelike design. This is Pong Quest, and it's essentially Pong by way of a roguelike. So, the game has you exploring procedurally generated dungeons, trying to solve or complete a quest, and we are going MacGuffin hunting in this one. Combat, as you can see, 
takes in the form of playing Pong. As you play, you will unlock various balls that can be used to modify your basically your shots, such as a ice ball, a curve ball, speed, so on and so on. And killing enemies will allow you to level up, which will allow you to do things such as improve your health, change the size of your paddle, and again, it just keeps on going from there. Now, as you can see with combat, it reminds me a lot of the hypergalactic table tennis game we played a few months ago, in that simply hitting the ball back will do damage, and of course scoring a goal does more damage. Kill the enemy, and as you can see things move on from there. And I do have to commend developers for doing something different in terms of trying to elevate these classic designs. Now with Pong Quest, as, you, as you're watching here, you can see just how kind of repetitive, unfortunately, the gameplay gets. If you're hoping for more in terms of different takes on Pong or on that kind of gameplay, it did not seem to do that. And some balls just seem to be more overpowered than others, as you can see with this lovely little curveball here that can completely screw up your aim. Now, the dungeons themselves are built on multiple levels, and as you play through, the dungeons are going to get bigger and it will become harder to kind of get through on a single run. If you die, you have to restart the dungeon. And I do not remember if there was any sense of long-term persistence other than unlocking new cosmetics. It's a decent idea, but I don't think the Pong style gameplay is enough to keep somebody engaged for hours and hours on end. And the dungeons themselves, I do like how they're designed to have different events, different rules that can mess with you. But again, it all falls back on Pong. And if you're watching this and you do not like Pong at all, this game is not going to make you a fan of it. And yes, there's a lot of jokes and puns and things along those lines. And I think the problem is that it didn't really feel like you could do a lot with the Pong gameplay. I know that's a very weird complaint. What I mean is that with something like table, uh, hypergalactic table tennis, you had a little bit more control over the ball in terms of how you would put a spin on it and just the realistic physics that went into the ball. This game didn't seem to have that, and it felt harder to make more complicated shots or kind of make things interesting along those lines. But with that said, I think we have time for one more game to spotlight in this video. And we turn to an interesting one. This is Verdant Village. This is an itch.io game. And this is one that a shark suggested that I take a look at. And what the developer is going for is, well, essentially Stardew Valley, but it appears to be a more involved version of it. Now, for this one, we did not play a lot of it on stream, and that was primarily because this game is still very much early in its development. It is not available on Steam, and I believe this will be considered like a pre-alpha or more in the prototype or very much early stages. Now again, keep in mind that when we played this on stream, this was about probably two, maybe three months at the time that you're watching this video. So I do not know if there has been anything new added to it. But from what I gathered on stream, that the game itself is still very much rough. You have the basic UI of Stardew Valley. You can see the map here. It's definitely a, a lot more sizable. But one of the things about like playing these kinds of like early prototype or early build games is that it's hard to really show them off in a positive light, especially when content is missing. You can see lovely little notes like that. And that was pretty much why we didn't spend a lot of time with it. Again, the basics are here. You can chop trees, you can plant goods or plant uh, vegetables and fruit. 
And the game seems to again have that very basic look to it at the moment. There is an overarching story about our character having amnesia and a kingdom in trouble, but we didn't play enough to see that. And this is one of those games I would say to keep an eye on. If you are a fan of, again, the Stardew Valley farming sim kind of design. And as I said, if the game was further along, if there was more to it and more things we could examine with it, we would have played it more on stream. And I'm definitely considered going back to this one, depending upon how the development shakes out. But with that said, that is going to do it for this latest Indie Dev Showcase video. I would like to thank developers who submitted games for it. You'll find, once again, links to all the games in the description down below. And if you'd like me to look at your game in a future video or for a sponsored piece, please get in touch. And check back every Wednesday night for our Indie Dev Showcase streams. Thanks again for watching. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we some of the art and science of games. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design. And come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on game wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.